Our next speaker will be Mary Azahabi, <coughs> and she will be speaking about the kernels for implicit hitting sets and packing problems. And okay, thank you. So uh, I will start with uh, some backgrounds. What are the problems that we are going to talk about? Uh, then I will uh, say a few words about the main tools that uh, we have used. And uh, I won't uh, really get into details uh, for the kernels that we got, but uh, if there will be time, then I will also say a few words at least uh, uh, about uh, the outline for uh, one of the problems that we've studied. So first, uh, let me define the problems that we studied. So uh, essentially, we looked at uh, problems that can be cast as uh, special cases of either three heating set or three set uh, packing. So what is a three heating set? So we are given a family F of uh, sets of size three over some universe U, and you have an integer K, and you ask yourself whether you can pick uh, K elements uh, from the universe, or so a subset S of the universe of size at most K, such that it hits each one of the sets in your family. Okay, it has a non-empty intersection, which hits one of the sets in F. Okay, so uh, one of the two problems that we've looked at uh, in this context is cluster vertex deletion. So here you are given a graph uh, G and uh, an integer K, as, and you ask yourself if you can pick at most uh, K vertices in this graph G, such that when you delete them, you get a cluster graph. What it means, it, it simply means that uh, this is a graph where every connected component is a click. Okay? So then you ask yourself, why is this problem, uh, how can it be cast and as a special case of three heating set? So look at your graph, and, uh, um, and the family F that uh, we need is actually the collection of uh, vertex sets of all of the induced P3s in the, in the graph G. Because the graph is a cluster graph if and only if it does not have an induced P3. Yes, this is a, a path on uh, three vertices, induced path on three vertices. Okay? Good, so uh, the second problem that we looked at is feedback vertex set in tournaments. So here you are given a tournament directed a graph, where when you look at every pair of vertices, every pair of vertices UV, then what happens is that at least one of the edges UV or VU is present in the tournament. Okay, just a second. Okay, so I will do without the pointer. And um, okay, and uh, what we ask ourselves in this problem is whether you can uh, find a set S of at most K vertices, such that when you delete them for your tournament, it becomes a cyclic. Okay, there's no uh, uh, cycle, uh, in directed cycle in the, in the graph. Okay, so um, how can this be cast as a special case of a three heating set? So now the family F of uh, a sets of size three is simply the collection of triangles of cycles on three vertices. Okay, because the tournament is a cyclic if and only if it does not have a triangle, this is sufficient. Okay, so far this is good. So we looked at uh, these two problems that can be cast as uh, special cases of uh, three heating set. And uh, you can see in this table that uh, what was known before our work is that these two uh, problems, uh, their situation is, was better than the situation of three heating set in uh, several uh, aspects. So there are faster uh, uh, parameterized algorithms. You can see for a three heating set, for example, 2.076 and CVD 1.911. And there are also better approximation algorithms, but uh, also there are better ex exact exponential time algorithms. But uh, for a kernel, the situation was uh, the same for uh, all of these three problems. And uh, okay, so we have uh, kernels with uh, k to the power of three many sets and uh, with k to the power of too many elements, you see vertices for CVD and FVST, cluster vertex deletion and feedback vertex set in tournaments. Um, and uh, in terms of sets, uh, I mean, we don't uh, expect an improvement in the sense that we know that you cannot get a size that is uh, k to the power of three minus epsilon uh, unless something that is uh, unbelievable uh, happens. And uh, 
what we did in this work is that we got a better number of elements for CVD and FVST. Okay, so for these uh, particular uh, cases, you can see that we get better than uh, k square. Um, k to the power of 5 over 3 for uh, CVD and k to the 3 over 2 for FVST, and that solved uh, an open problem for, from Walker uh, almost uh, 10 years ago. And uh, also I want to say that uh, we looked at the at three set packing problems that the corresponding problems that can be cast as uh, special cases of three set packing. So here we are given a family F of sets of size three and a universe U and an integer K. And you ask yourself whether there exists a sub a subfamily of F of size K where the se sets are pairwise disjoint. Okay? And then you can ask similar questions to CVD and FVST in the following sense. Now we have induced P3 uh, packing. So here we have a graph G and an integer K. And we ask ourselves whether we can find a collection K of uh, pairwise vertex disjoint P3s, uh, uh, induced uh, P3s in G. And uh, we also have, uh, so, so you can, uh, I, I will soon say a few words that this is actually, uh, can be thought of as a special case of three set uh, packing. And we also have uh, the question for tournaments where we are given a tournament and an integer K and we ask ourselves whether we can find a collection of uh, K vertex disjoint uh, uh, triangles in the tournament. When you say induced, do you mean that the two different P3s have no edges between them, which would be the normal meaning of induced? No, so when I say induced, I mean that when you look at the path on three vertices, then the two endpoints do not have an edge between them. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So you can see that these are uh, special cases, this can be thought of as uh, special cases of three set uh, packing. For example, induced P3 packing. So take your family F, the family of sets that you want to pack. So take, them as, uh, take the vertex set of the induced P3s in the graph G. Okay? And here you take the vertex sets of the triangles in the tournament. And uh, we got uh, similar kernels for these problems too, using uh, quite similar ideas. And also with the same, roughly the same size bound, and the same number of vertices. Okay, so now I want to s at least uh, say something about the main tools that we used. So it will be maybe slightly out of context of uh, how we actually apply them, but at least I want to introduce these uh, two tools because I think that they can be very useful for uh, other problems as well. Um, so uh, essentially like the, the main tools that we used are a uh, new uh, uh, expansion lemma and a new, new tool that is related to account decomposition. We call it a weak form of account decomposition. So I'm going to introduce briefly what is account decomposition and expansion lemma. I guess most of you know this is like slides that I used uh, in class. And uh, so a count decomposition, it's a partition of the vertex set uh, into three parts, C, H, and R. And it has uh, several uh, properties. So you can see that C here is an independent set. And uh, you can see that uh, there's no edge with one endpoint in C and one endpoint in R. And there's also a certain condition related to matching between C and H. And uh, what is important for me to say about this now is that uh, uh, essentially what we want to prove is that there exists a solution or maybe any optimal solution picks uh, the head of the crown here. Okay, so it picks the head of the crown, H, and it uh, discards C. So the solution contains H and has an empty intersection with C. Okay, and um, the point uh, about uh, a weak uh, counter composition, it, it is a relaxation of a counter uh, the composition, at least conceptual, in the following sense. So now we, sh we don't say that uh, we pick all of the vertices in the head edge, but we get to a situation where we can say that we pick m almost all of the vertices in the head edge. And also we don't say that none of the vertices in the crown, none of the vertices in the set C is not picked, but we say that Almost all of them are not picked. 
And uh, another thing that is uh, similar to what's happening in the cone decomposition, but not exactly the same, is that we don't say that there are no edges between a C and R, but instead like the interaction between these two sets is structured. So uh, what does it mean uh, in our case? Is that in CVD where we actually where this is the problem where we apply this tool, then we find some uh, small subset M of the of the set C, such that when you remove this, then uh, the graph induced by uh, C minus this uh, small set M. So it, this this will actually be a collection of clicks, and each one of these clicks will be a module with respect to R. So if you look at each one of the clicks there, so each one of the vertices in these clicks has the same uh, neighborhood in R. So it is structured in this sense, in the sense of modules. Okay, so we we can have edges between um, the the sets C and R, but they are, they behave in a very particular way. Okay. So now let me uh, also say something about uh, expansion lemma, and then I will uh, <coughs> say what is different in uh, our work. That we use a, a different, like a more general expansion lemma that we call double expansion lemma. So first, a Q star is simply a star that has Q leaves. And when you talk about Q expansion, then uh, we have here some uh, bipartite graph. You can see the bipartition A and B here in the picture. And we say that the set uh, of uh, address M is a Q expansion of uh, A into B if uh, the following two conditions hold. So every vertex in A is incident to exactly K, uh, Q uh, address in uh, M. And uh, also you can see that exactly Q times the size of A many vertices in B are used. So maybe it's simpler to think about it uh, as follows, it's simply that you have a collection of uh, the size of A many uh, uh, disjoint uh, Q stars, such as the centers of these stars are these vertices in A. Okay, so here you can see an example of a Q expansion. When Q is equal to 2, then you can see that we have here a star for each one of the vertices in A, and that star has uh, two leaves in B. Okay? And uh, this follows from the definition that each one of the vertices in A must be a center of some star. Um, okay, so what the expansion lemma tells us is that uh, if the, side, the size of the side B there is large enough, at least uh, Q times the size of A, and there are no isolated vertices in B, then you can find non-empty subset X of A and Y on B, uh, of B, such that uh, there is a Q expansion of uh, X into A, and also all of the neighborhood of uh, Y is contained in the set X. Okay, so this is the, the uh, expansion lemma. I guess if you see this for the first time, then it's not clear. This is more like a reminder. And you can compute this uh, set uh, X and Y uh, in polynomial time. Okay. So let me just uh, briefly give you an example. So here you can see that uh, we have a bipartite graph uh, and the size of the side B is uh, large enough. It, it, it is at least twice the size of A, Q is equal to two. And furthermore, there are no isolated vertices here in the side B. Then uh, we can find the sets uh, X and Y uh, such that you, we have uh, two expansions from X into Y, and you can see that all of, this, uh, all of the neighborhood of the vertices in Y, the, uh, all of the neighbors are there in X. Okay? When uh, Q is equal to... Uh, when Q is equal to 1, this is exactly uh, a count decomposition. Okay. You can think about it as a count decomposition. Okay. So, uh, first let's uh, view the expansion lemma slightly differently. So I want to use this view towards the introduction of the double expansion lemma. So the different view is as follows. So now we have the bipartite graph uh, G with bipartition A and B. But uh, now we don't demand that uh, the side B is large enough or that it does not have uh, isolated vertices. Okay, so we don't have these two uh, restrictions. And uh, what we find are again a subsets X of A and Y of, of uh, B such that 
now the same two conditions, uh, we needed them again. There is the Q expansion of X into Y, and all of the neighbors of uh, the vertices in Y are there in X. But uh, now what we have uh, is also the requirement that uh, the size of B minus Y is at most Q times the size of A minus X. Okay. So we have this uh, extra condition uh, there. Okay. So notice that now we do have this uh, extra condition, but uh, the sets X and Y can be empty. Okay, but uh, notice that it is quite similar to the normal expansion lemma. For example, if the size of B is uh, large enough, larger than Q times A, then necessarily the set Y cannot be empty. Otherwise, you cannot uh, satisfy this uh, third uh, new requirement. So this is similar in this sense. And furthermore, uh, all of these uh, isolated vertices that uh, now can now uh, be part of the set B, we can just put them in Y. So if you think uh, about this view, then essentially what is happening here that in the normal expansion lemma, it's like we are keeping all of the vertices that we want, all of the vertices that are important for us. And here what we do, it's like we are discarding all of the vertices that we don't, we are sure that we don't want. And uh, okay, so uh, now having this view in mind, I will uh, introduce the double expansion lemma. So here we are given a bipartite graph G, and we also have a co this collection of uh, bipartite graphs HI. For we have D of them. Okay, so now we don't have just one bipartite graph, but we have this uh, bipartite graph G, and in addition we have uh, D uh, uh, other bipartite graphs. And uh, notice that uh, they share the same uh, vertices. Um, the, ver the, vertex, the vertex sets A1 to AD are pairwise disjoints, and each one of them is a subset of uh, A. And uh, B1, BD, uh, they are not only vertex disjoints, they are actually a partition. They form a partition of the side B of the bipartite graph G. Okay? And uh, what we say is that in this situation, we can find in polynomial time, a possibly empty subset x of a, y of b, and also xi of uh, each a, 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 i and yi of each b i, such that the following conditions holds. So first of all, uh, there is a Q expansion of x into y g, and also there is a Q expansion of each xi into each yi in hi. Uh, okay. So you can see that we have uh, the condition uh, as before, but it holds simultaneously for the graph G and for each of the bipartite graphs uh, HI. Okay, and in addition, we also have the neighborhood condition. So all of the neighbors of the uh, set uh, Y, they are there in the set uh, X in the graph G, and all of the neighbors of the vertices in YI, they are in XI in the bipartite graph uh, HI. We also have uh, the uh, third condition as before adapted to this situation. So the number of vertices in B minus Y is not too many. It's at most Q times uh, all of the, uh, X, the size of all of the XIs that we have there and uh, A minus X. And there is also a fourth condition. But uh, essentially what I want to say about this is that you can see that we have here uh, a way to simultaneously capture uh, both uh, properties that we want for the um, uh, bipartite graph G and also for each one of the uh, bipartite graphs HI. So the way that, uh, so, so this will be a bit abstract uh, uh, right now, but uh, think about this as follows. Like you have a problem that has a certain global, global constraints that you want to satisfy. So this you are trying to capture with the graph G. And additionally, there are certain local constraints. Like there are cer certain uh, parts of the graph that each one of them has its own local constraint. So this ones you try to capture with the smaller uh, bipartite graphs HI. And now when you apply this uh, expansion lemma, then in a sense you simultaneously capture all of these constraints, both the global constraints and each one of the local constraints. So let me just give you a little bit uh, context here so it might be uh, more clear. So suppose uh, that we are talking about feedback vertex set in tournaments and we have some approximate solution S. 
And now uh, look at the graph uh, at the tournament without this approximate solution S. So this is an acyclic tournament. So we have a topological ordering over the vertices of T minus S. We also insert the vertices of S back there in, in some way. That is not important th this particular way for now. But we have this uh, topological ordering. And then what we do uh, is that uh, we, we look at this topological ordering and we, we think about it as being partitioned in, er in two areas. And now you have uh, all of these triangles that you want to hit. Some of them go across different areas in this topological order. And then what happens is they are in global constraints in the sense. If you have a triangle that has one endpoint in one area and one endpoint in a, a, a far away place in the topological ordering, then it starts to behave like a vertex cover uh, constraint. And uh, you can use the bipartite graph G to capture it. And then you also have triangles that live in, uh, entirely in uh, certain areas in the topological uh, ordering. And then you use the bipartite graphs uh, HI to try to hit those triangles. OK, so uh, now I will uh, say a little bit uh, what is the outline that we have for a cluster vertex deletion. Um, so uh, on a high level, uh, what we do is first we find some approximate solution for cluster vertex deletion who size it at most 3K. This is not uh, difficult to do. Um, bounding the number of uh, clicks that we have in G minus S, right? S is an approximate solution, so G minus S is just a cluster graph, collection of clicks. So we can bound the number of clicks there using the normal expansion lemma. And then what we want to do is to try to get to a situation where we have a weak crown decomposition. So I will say something about uh, how we get uh, into this situation. After this situation, we also need to do uh, a lot of uh, uh, analysis to handle that. But uh, to get to that situation, we have a certain uh, marking procedure. What this procedure does is that uh, uh, initially, so, so, so we mark vertices as uh, alive or dead. So initially all of the vertices are alive. And then for K plus one stages, we, are, we do the following. For every vertex S in our approximate solution S that is still alive, okay, in the beginning everyone is alive, we try to associate uh, an edge that is not yet marked with it. So how we do this, we look at all the clicks that we have in G minus S, and we ask ourselves, we try to find the, an edge such that it has one endpoint adjacent to this vertex S in the approximate solution and one endpoint that is not. Think about it, this is like an edge that uh, um, is bad for us if we are aiming to, to get modules. Okay, so we, so we associate uh, this uh, edge with the, the vertex S and we mark it. And as long as, as, uh, uh, as we can do this, the vertex stays alive. Okay, so this is what this procedure uh, does. Uh, if, if at some uh, point the vertex cannot find an unmarked edge such so that it sees exactly one of its two endpoints, then the vertex dies. And uh, now we have uh, several uh, outcomes that can uh, happen from this procedure. If there is a vertex that is alive for uh, K plus one uh, uh, stages, then we are lucky. We just uh, uh, finish uh, all of the runs of this procedure and simply delete that vertex. If there is a vertex that uh, has uh, K plus one different edges associated with it, such as it is exactly one endpoint of each one of its edges, it is, it is just a vertex that is in uh, K plus one uh, uh, induced P3. It is the only common vertex there, so we can just delete it. So this, this is uh, the case where we are very lucky. But we say that we are successful if there are many vertices that were able to find their own uh, edges to mark. So if we are, when we are looking at uh, stage k to the power of uh, 2.2 over 3, there are k to the uh, power of 2 uh, over 3 vertices that were still al alive. So it means that there are k to the power of 2 over 3 many vertices, just that each one of them could, could find k to the power of 2 over 3 many uh, edges to mark. So uh, in this case, we mark all of these uh, vertices that stayed alive. And we just uh, um, we run this uh, procedure again as long as it is successful. So if each time it uh, marks some vertices that are still alive, we move them that, that are still alive in stage uh, k to the 2 over 3. We put them aside, and we run the entire procedure again. 
And uh, we have a set of uh, vertices U star. Those are the, the vertices that were uh, alive in each one of these uh, st uh, successful uh, stages. Okay, so this we marked by U star. And uh, in the last time that we run this procedure, it is not successful, and we denote by M the endpoints of all of the edges that were marked in this last run that was not successful. And then uh, what we observe is that actually we get a weak uh, count decomposition here. So I will briefly explain why it is a weak uh, count decomposition. So, this, uh, th so the vertices in Vg minus S, then uh, most of them should not be selected. Right, because uh, otherwise we already have a kernel. S is simply an approximate solution. Vg minus S is most of the vertices that you have in the graph. Otherwise, you are already done. So most of them should not be selected. This uh, set U star, we cannot say that all of these should be selected. This is what we would ideally, ideally want to say, but we cannot say that. But at least we can say that most of the vertices in U star should be selected, because re recall that each one of these vertices uh, uh, in U star, how, why did we insert that? Because it was part of a stage where there were many vertices alive, and each one of them had many vertices that it marked. So we are able to argue that most of the vertices in U star uh, should be uh, selected in every optimal solution. And uh, one other thing that we are able to say is that the interaction between all of the vertices that are not in the approximate solution and all of these vertices that were not alive for enough stages in any of the runs, the interaction between these two parts uh, is uh, very structured. When you remove the vertices in M, then actually all of the clicks that you, uh, that you have here, they become modules with respect to uh, the, this set of vertices. So I, d I don't know if this is immediate to see, but you can see that it is at least makes sense uh, uh, in terms of uh, how we marked vertices. We always marked for some uh, vertex and edge, so that it, it sees at least one, uh, exactly one of its endpoints. So it makes sense that uh, when we remove these uh, marked vertices, we will get modules. Um, okay, and then, and then uh, once we have this kind of composition, we do some more analysis that is based on the expansion lemma and get uh, the kernel. So I will skip this part for now. I just wanted to at least say how we reach the situation where we have a weak kind of composition. And uh, okay, and uh, just to conclude, so um, what is interesting, uh, uh, I think what is interesting for further research is to uh, ask uh, what other implicit three hitting set and three set packing problems admit kernels with a few elements, uh, k to the power of two minus epsilon many elements. And uh, you can even ask this uh, question for three hitting set and three set packing themselves. Do they admit kernels with k to the power of two minus epsilon elements? And in fact, maybe these problems even admit kernels with a linear number of elements. We don't know. And uh, what is the take home messages for here is that there are uh, two tools that uh, I think can be useful for many other problems, which are the double expansion lemma, uh, where you have some problem and you are able to, uh, and you want to capture some global constraint and you also have a smaller uh, local constraint and it seems like it is related to expansion lemma, but you want to capture all of them simultaneously, then maybe the double expansion lemma can be useful. And also the weak uh, form of uh, count decomposition, which uh, I explained in the end, this is another tool that might be useful for uh, other problems. Okay, thank you. question was for which implicit hitting sets we have such a kernel, so for which uh, problem do you prove it? Just for these two or? Yes, so it is four problems because it is two that are uh, for uh, that I can be cast at three hitting set problems and two that can be cast at three set packing problems. So which other problems uh, we don't uh, know this, uh, so I think that it is interesting to us. I know that for some problems we there are some other problems such that it is known, but uh, yeah. So what other cases we can we can. Uh, so did you try some? Uh, uh, so, for example, in the open problem session, then uh, Saket uh, asks about uh, uh, feedback vertex set. So this is not exactly fits here, but this is another uh, problem where it's interesting to ask whether k to the power of two minus epsilon uh, vertices is possible. Or CP on perfect class. Uh, yeah. 
feedback vertex set into coronal graphs is zero three, or uh, co graph solution like implicit uh, four vertex set. These all this in my opinion should have been here. Um, look, for uh, CVD we got k to the 5 over 3, maybe we're pushing the ideas further than k to the 3 over 2, uh, so at least uh, be doable.